So for the past six years, this MacBook Pro right here has been considered basically the king, the best ever made. It's the mid-2015 15-inch higher-end dual graphics MacBook Pro. This has been the one to buy, the one that people skipped an entire generation for because it was so freaking good. But it has been six years now. These things are getting up there. They're the oldest MacBook Pros that are still supported in macOS Monterey. And so that begs the question. This has been the best of the best for six years, but is it good enough now in 2021? So today we're gonna try to figure out if this is still a viable machine to go out and buy. Make sure to get subscribed because this is gonna be a fun one. Let's jump into it. Today's video is sponsored by iFixit because I'll let you in on a little secret, folks. These MacBook Pros are upgradable. Heck yeah. You can upgrade the storage all by yourself. It does not take a lot of effort and iFixit is here to help you out. So I've got links down below if you wanna learn how to upgrade the storage on your 2012 to 2015 generation MacBook Pro. It's super easy to do. iFixit's got you covered. They've got the parts, tools, and the resources to get all of that done. So check out the links in the description below. Big thanks to them for sponsoring today's video. And now let's hop back into it. So I've actually owned a couple of these mid-2015 MacBook Pros over the past four years or so and they have just been consistently really, really good. So I bought my first one back in 2017, and that one was almost identical to this, actually, this configuration. This is the 2.5 gigahertz Core i7, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a terabyte of storage, and the Radeon M370X graphics. So that's basically the same configuration that I bought in 2017, I owned that one for about a year or so, and I sold it for more than I paid for it. Um, I've owned this particular one for over a year now, and I've made several videos on it, talking about how it continues to hold up. But now we've had another really big development, which is, of course, the big fancy new stuff, the M1 Pro and M1 Max. And this is sort of a spiritual successor to everything that made this MacBook Pro so great. I mean, you have to understand, people literally skipped five years of MacBooks because of how good this was. And it's not just because of its performance, right? That wasn't the only reason. If you look back at the 16-inch Intel MacBook Pro, it obviously is much faster than this. This is a Haswell i7. We're talking about pretty old AMD graphics, DDR3, RAM, like this isn't a new, snappy, fresh, computer, but the reason that people kept these things, I mean, it's really quite simple. It's the keyboard and the ports. That's why these things stuck around. And so in a really rare move, these new MacBooks are actually Apple acknowledging that everyone was right all along. All of us pros out here that have been saying for six years that this was the best MacBook, we were right. Apple admitted that we were right. That's why they gave us this. I mean, look at the side profile of these devices. We have a USB interface. Now, of course, it's USB type C. Uh, and then we also have SD card and HDMI. It's the same configuration. I mean, what more do you need? This is literally Apple saying, hey, sorry, you, you were right all along. We'll go back to what was, what was working before. But, you know, it's $2,500 just to start. This particular configuration with the M1 Max, 64 gigabytes. Th th this is $4,000. This is not in the realm of where a lot of people are shopping. And so that's why it is worth asking the question, like, can we go back, can we look at a six-year-old MacBook, which is now more like 500 bucks compared to 4,000, and, and still find merit in this six-year-old design? We gotta start off evaluating this thing by talking about the elephant in the room, and that is performance. And you know, quite frankly, it's not great. This is a six year old device. It's got a quad core Haswell i7. This is from peak, what I like to call the complacency period, 
where Intel basically just wasn't changing a whole lot of stuff, right? You look at Max from 2011, quad-core hyper-threaded i7s. You look at Max from 2017, six years later, they're still running quad-core hyper-threaded i7s. From 2011 to 2017, Intel had no competition. They had no motivation to change stuff. And as a result of that, you know, I'm running Cinebench over here. Uh, this thing scores about 3676 in Cinebench R23. So for reference, that's pretty similar to a lot of quad-core machines. It's almost actually identical to the 2016 and 2017 MacBook Pros. Uh, so that's that alone is pretty interesting, right? Because these are a lot more affordable. And so you're also gonna get pretty similar performance on these to the quad-core 13-inch MacBook Pros from 2018, from 2019. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. These are also more affordable than those. And unlike all of the 2016, 17, 18, and 2019 stuff, there is no butterfly keyboard on here. So take that for what it's worth, which is probably a lot. Uh, another thing, though, that you might be able to hear already is the fans. So I'm not even done with the first run. We've already got fans totally kicking in here. Looks like our uh, CPU is running at 96 degrees Celsius. So why am I bringing that up? Well, this is still Intel, right? One of the big reasons why this was considered a fantastic package is because it didn't have the same thermal throttling issues that we saw on like the 2018 MacBook Pro. This generation was praised for being comparatively not as bad, but now that we're comparing our frame of reference to Apple Silicon, this is still not good. I mean, we're talking, we're at 97 degrees here. Fans are, are going pretty audibly. And I've only been pushing the CPU for like a minute or two. Okay, this is getting too loud. I gotta kill this. We're gonna ruin my audio. Yeesh. Okay, we also burned through quite a bit more battery than I would have thought given how brief that test was. Uh, keep in mind, you know, we do have a, a discrete graphics card in here that's pulling like 35 watts when that's in use. We have a 45 watt CPU. Like, th this is gonna suck down its battery a lot more quickly than more recent Macs. It's also, you know, it's a six year old computer. The battery, chances are it's gonna be a lot more worn. I actually don't know how many cycles are on this one. Uh, 386, so that's definitely on the lower side for, you know, a six year old device such as this. So that's one of the other caveats that you're gonna have compared to Apple Silicon. You know, you're gonna have heat, you're gonna have noise, you're not gonna get great performance, and you're not gonna get fantastic battery life. However, you know, we are talking about a $500 package compared to even $1,000 or 850 for a refurbished MacBook Air. You could still argue that that's a pretty significant difference in price. And I'm getting a terabyte of storage here, so like that's something, we can't discount that, right? Uh, another big thing that you have to keep in mind with this generation of MacBook Pro is the storage is upgradable. You can upgrade it yourself at home super duper easily. You can buy a direct replacement, an OEM SSD, uh, which I would recommend because those uh, tend to boot really, really logically and consistently. Uh, you can also use third-party SSDs with adapters. I'll link those down below, but those sometimes will kernel panic or will shut down unexpectedly. They can have some weird behavior. Um, so if you just go on eBay and buy an OEM one terabyte drive, boom, upgrade your drive, there you go. That's, that's a really huge thing to have. You can upgrade the RAM on these, of course. Uh, that's just been a thing now for about 10 years. But the fact that you can upgrade the storage yourself on a sub $500 MacBook, that's really, really big. So yeah, this is definitely a take with you device. It does not feel huge. It does not feel super heavy, uh, but you do get that 15 inch display. Now, obviously it's not 16.2 inches. It's not mini LED. It's not ProMotion. It's a normal 2880 by 1800 retina display. However, we're talking about a $500 device with a 1440p plus display, IPS, fantastic viewing angles, excellent color accuracy, great peak brightness. This is a great display for the money. The big issue that you have to watch out for on these particular MacBook Pros, especially if you try to buy a really, really cheap one, is you'll find that anything that you, anything that's like too good to be true 
it's because there's issues with the display coating. That was a big issue that almost all Retina MacBook Pros continue to have. Like this is something that Apple still has not really fixed. Be really careful because if you buy one that's super delaminated, it looks really ugly and there's not a lot you can do about it. So I would definitely spend a little extra and just get one that's not delaminated and then just like take care of it. But overall, I think this design held up really well. We've got MagSafe, we've got the same classic speaker grills on the side of the keyboard. We got the glowing Apple logo on the back. A lot of people really wanted this to come back. This is the one thing that Apple was like, no, this is gone for good. But really overall, you would not be able to tell that this is almost a 10 year old design. It launched in June of 2012. That's crazy for it to still look this good. Dated, sure, 10 years old, no, not at all. This looks really good for its age. But because this is a 2015, we actually get a force touch trackpad. That's something that you would take for granted if you've had any MacBook that's newer than this, but this is where it started. The force touch trackpad is, it's just the best. It's just the best. If you're using an older MacBook and you've never used a force touch trackpad, go into an Apple store and try one. It, you can't go back. I'm sorry, this is the best trackpad in the business and this is where it started. This is the first MacBook Pro that got it. Again, keyboard, same story. It's fantastic. It types really, really well. This is before they ruined it with the butterfly. So there's literally nothing to complain about. This is the quintessential MacBook keyboard. One thing that there is to complain about is the speakers. Uh, this is the year before Apple really stepped up their audio game and they've really, really been stepping it up uh, with the 2019 16 inch and now with the new MacBook Pros, the audio is fantastic. On here, not so much. Take a listen. It's a little rough, right? The new MacBooks, I, I listen to music, I watch YouTube videos, sometimes even edit videos just on the built-in speakers. This, this MacBook Pro, I would not do that. Uh, these are passable if you need them, but for everything else, it's AirPods or headphone jack for me. It's got everything that you need. It doesn't have anything crazy. It doesn't have crazy good performance. It doesn't have very good graphics. It doesn't even have uh, Thunderbolt 4. That's something that I would like. You know, Thunderbolt 2 is not the most useful interface anymore. We do have USB 3 ports, so that's good. We have HDMI, we have SD card, we have MagSafe. What more do you want? That is the story of this computer. Yeah, it's no longer, you know, the best. It's no longer uh, better than what you can buy now, which was the case in 2016, 2017, even 2018. But when you're considering the fact that this is a $500, sometimes even $400 laptop, frankly, that doesn't really bother me, right? This is 500 bucks. At 500 bucks, if I'm expecting this thing to have class leading performance, be able to munch through 4K footage, that's an unreasonable expectation, right? It's six years old, it's 500 bucks, what do you expect? But for what it is, a big screen, totally usable everyday task computer, you could throw some photo editing, you could throw some light video editing at it, this thing can totally handle it. That's fantastic. Now I will offer a caveat and that is to keep an eye on M1 MacBook Airs because those are $1,000 new. So twice the price of these things. They're $850 on Apple's refurbished store and you can get those pretty frequently. So if you are buying one of these and you end up saying like, oh, well, I wanna get one that's in good condition with the charger included, with a terabyte, with all the loaded out specs, you start pushing up to $650. Once you get to that point, 650 bucks, I, I'd say like, Let's take a step back and say, okay, 200 bucks is all that's standing between this and an M1 MacBook Air. At that point, you really gotta consider making that jump. At $500, I think you're in a good spot here, but keep an eye on the M1 MacBook Air because that is the biggest threat to this thing going forward in terms of value. I'm curious to know what you guys think, so let me know in the comments below. And with that, I will see you guys 
in the next video.